Silence. I mean, salam alaikum. Just making sure y'all are awake. Just making sure everybody's awake. This was supposed to be an hour session. We're cutting it to 45, inshallah, so that you guys can get home upstairs, pray your 300 rakahs, and go to sleep, inshallah. All right? We're good? We're okay? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We begin the name of Allah. All praise and glory be to Allah and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions, every last one of them. We ask Allah at the onset of this gathering, all of our actions righteous and make them sincerely for his sake and not allow any of his creation a share of our intentions. May Allah teach us that which benefits us and benefit us with that which he teaches us and to increase us in beneficial knowledge. May Allah continue to conceal our flaws and remove them from us and to forgive us for what he alone knows about us. Allahumma ameen. So we are welcoming everyone officially to the uh, special edition of the Behind the Mimbar uh, podcast, New Jersey Da'wah edition. For those unfamiliar, uh, Behind the Mimbar was an initiative that I very reluctantly uh, started with my team at the IECPA uh, for about the past six months now. We've just been trying to gently uh, prod forward the conversations about the masjid being more than a mimbar. And there is so much more that goes into and behind uh, having a better masjid having a masjid that can be idnillah, be worthy of the light that it was intended by Allah to omit. And so we're dovetailing that discussion this evening with the masjid's capacity in producing heroes. We all know the famous adage that uh, it takes a village to raise a child. And so we've uh, co-opted it, <laughs> we've appropriated it to say that it takes uh, a masjid to build a hero. And so inshallah Azza wa Jal, we are very blessed to have uh, not one guest as we usually do have in these discussions that you can find uh, online at IECPA's YouTube channel. But alhamdulillah, three uh, specialists that combine between having uh, uh, tactical experience or on the ground, uh, you know, uh, clout, traction, years under their belt, alhamdulillah, but also in other parts uh, of wider society, they are involved and due to that can bring additional vantage points, additional perspectives with which inshallah we can refine our craft and better uh, our Islamic work in our communities to make it more and more, as Dr. Altaf Hussein often puts it, ihsanic work, work of excellence. So uh, Imam Tom, we've had these conversations, I'll start with you online and offline. And instead of me explaining further what Behind the Mimbar does, can, can we uh, sort of set the stage speaking about why we aspire for more, especially when it comes to the masajid? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salat, salam, rasulillah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why the masjid needs to be sort of unlocked as a technology. Oh, I'm going to use the fancy terms and I'll break it down. The technology of subject formation or the site of subject formation. Basically, if you want to make a hero like uh, like the Sheikh was saying just a moment ago, there needs to be an ecosystem, right? There needs to be, um, whether that's human capital, right? Mentors, brothers, sisters, right? People, aunties and uncles. And there needs to be facilities. You need to have somewhere to go, something to do, right? And if our, if our situation in America is that we have a lot of facilities, which we do, we have, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of facilities, but they're sort of, Compromise, or they're not reaching their potential for what they could be doing when it comes to uh, bringing up the next generation of heroes, then we need like all hands on deck like yesterday to figure out how we can unlock the masjid in order to sort of build those heroes because that's what we really need right now. Um, so again, your question. <laughs> so I try very hard, uh, and you do as well, mashallah, that's why I love you, <laughs> to be solution oriented. But let's start with the pain point or the problem question, as they okay. say. Okay, the pain point is this. Okay, when I was in Medina, alhamdulillah, one of the things I was uh, blessed to do was to lead tours on Hajj and Umrah. And one time in one of the groups that I led, um, you know, there's a lot of 
older ladies, right? And if you get the older ladies to touch the Kaaba, they're like, you know, they're indebted to you and you get their prayers for the rest of your life. So that's what I used to do. I used to make sure, you know, take them around the back end, let them touch the Kaaba, everyone cries, and alhamdulillah, now I've got their dua for life. So there were three, there were three Moroccan ladies that were older, they had never been on, on Hajj before. And subhanAllah, you know, they said something that like, really hit me and it made me feel happy but sad at the same time after we were done the whole thing. They said, we wish that the imams that we grew up with were nice like you. And it just like, that was like a gut punch because I like, it was almost like a see, seeing a movie like play out before your eyes. Like I could imagine the religious types that they had experienced. I can imagine sort of how the masajid that they were probably had in their neighborhoods were like, you know, get out of here, kids, you're making too much noise. All the things that are now like fairly stereotypical. And it just made me sad. It was like these sisters, and you could tell that they had spent most of their life far from the deen. And then it took them until their 50s or 60s or 70s to come back around, and now they were coming back around. And so the sadness of that moment was just like, oh man, I just felt the decades that were wasted, like how many people could have been benefited or could they have benefited had they had a positive masjid experience, had they had people who were supportive in the masjid, um, we really are sort of our own worst enemy when it comes to you know, what we call the user experience, right? Like what does the average person feel or experience when they come to the masjid? When I converted to Islam, uh, and the first community that I was ever part of was down in, in South Jersey, where I'm from. It took about two months for a person to say salam to me. And I will never, wallahi alim, I will never forget the brother. It's going to be a secret, but it will, I will never forget the brother that gave my, gave my first salam when I showed up. Those little things, you know, you don't think if you're in the in-group, and I'm taking up too much space, so I'm gonna like shut up in a second. But you, if you're in the in-group that the masjid is already sort of made for you, you have your extended family, you come from a Muslim culture, you know, you have the you know, extended relatives that you visit, you come to the masjid once in a while for programs and things like that, the masjid works for you, right? So you don't think about it. But if you're the traveler, if you're the convert, if you're the person that shows up to the masjid with high hopes, maybe you've been reading about Islam for months, you finally get up the courage to come to the masjid, and the door is locked. Right? Or you finally start going to the masjid and you've got so many questions and everybody just kind of walks by you and doesn't even say hi. Right? That's the user experience that people need to start thinking about when they think about how, what can we be doing for our masjid to help you know, bring better leaders to the fore and build heroes. Jazakallah khairan for that. I, uh, I always find it truly a struggle to, to balance between بالإيمان, oh, our Lord, forgive us and our brethren that have preceded us in faith. And those are not just the Sahaba and the Tabi'un and the early scholars and the forerunners and so on and so forth. It's even just one generation prior. A lot of work has been put in for those lots of places that we see now. But at the same time, right, you have to be careful of, you know, over appreciating that. And it's see, even saying it is uncomfortable because it could land you in a place of satisfaction, complacency, because the Prophet ﷺ also used to himself say, and this is so telling, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika mimma a'amilta wa mimma lam a'mal. Oh Allah, protect me, meaning from the potential bad consequences of the things I've done. Maybe I could have done them better, right? Maybe I could have done them with a better intention or with sort of a better quality. And from the things I did not do, meaning I could have done or I was supposed to do. And there's so much that, you know, uh, hindsight is 2020. but, you know, to, to keep it specific as I pivot over to Dr. Zara and sort of we've been collaborating in the da'wah, uh, it's, wow, it's been 10 years since your father, Rahimahullah's janazah is when we first, I guess, crossed paths. That was before I moved to Allentown, so that makes it, you know, almost 10 years now. When you speak about sort of the in-group or the individual that finally got his salam, uh, I personally feel this, and I'm not even uh, on the sister side of the musalla, right? That there's an entire segment of the community that may feel sort of barred from access a lot of times. And uh, can you share with us sort of a, a way around this or the weight of this in your own even anecdotal experiences? Bismillah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess there's people's personal experiences and uh, every masjid is different and every shaykh and imam and 
uh, religious leader and scholar is different, so don't want to paint everyone with the same uh, you know, brush here, but certainly there's sisters, perhaps there's a pattern of experiencing like a form of second-class citizenship, you know, for lack of a better word, in certain spaces, uh, Muslim spaces and masajid, where perhaps the knowledge or testimony or experience or claims of women are just met with, you know, suspicion at times. Not, again, not by everyone, but, uh, you know, by some in certain spaces. So I think it would be um, instructive to follow a little bit of uh, Imam Tom's reminder here and extend it to other groups of people who may feel like they're not... Uh, welcome or uh, not as valuable as other members of the society? In your, uh, without outing you too much, but in your reading, mashallah, which is, alhamdulillah, uh, something we all draw from and benefit from, of your understanding, even if you may consider yourself a lay person, of the, uh, the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, or are the sacred truths we have in the Quran and sunnah, uh, does anything come to mind as to like, we wish the masjid could have been a little more Medinan, right? We wish the, uh, the format, the framework, uh, the expectations were a little bit more prophetic. Do, do you often sort of uh, uh, wish the masajid were more uh, informed, to be honest? Because the absence of imams causes a void, even in the Islamic ethos of the masajid. And so it's not like we need to actually even go outside, right, to find these values. So would you be comfortable speaking to that at all? Yeah, inshallah. I mean, just in very general terms, um, I'll, I'll give an example, and then I'll bring it back to this issue of uh, women in Muslim spaces. But for example, what's happening uh, in Palestine right now, right? We've all, in the last few months, really uh, started using a very sophisticated language of looking at the situation in broader terms and global terms and using um, what we can call like a political analysis, right? And we're starting to talk about the systems in the world uh, that are allowing and supporting the genocide of Palestinian people by Israel and may Allah's help come quickly and swiftly and may Allah humiliate the oppressors, inshallah. I mean, but, um, but now that we have this language and we understand that there are systems in the world that work to you know, keep uh, oppression supported and, and continue to exist, we can use that same conceptual language and use it to address, for example, if there's a pattern of uh, Muslim sisters who don't feel comfortable or welcome or that our knowledge is not valued uh, among our male counterparts, among you know, some among the leadership, right? So sisters who might use a language and say, well, this is a pattern or this is a bit systemic and let's address this issue. Maybe it would be good if, uh, among our leadership, if, if scholars and leaders were less suspicious of that kind of language, right? Now that we know that when it comes to, for example, to Palestine, that there are global and powerful and national uh, financial and media and narrative systems that are allowing this oppression to perpetuate. Obviously, I'm not drawing a parallel between what's being experienced uh, by the different groups that I'm talking about here, but I'm just saying that it might be beneficial to open our minds to frameworks for understanding if those frameworks can help us to actually work towards bettering people's conditions in the masjid and in the communities. No, that's phenomenal. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. And the Prophet ﷺ would do that. He would see sort of frameworks outside that worked and he had no problem accepting them وسلم, for bettering the condition of the people around him. Uh, we have, you know, I'm hearing you and I'm thinking of the Battle of the Trench. He had no problem importing a Sassanid mechanism, right, of the trench or the, the hadith in Sahih Muslim of, I was going to prohibit you from al-ghila. Al-ghila is essentially uh, the husband being with his wife in the period where she is nursing her newborn child, right? He said, but I saw that it didn't harm the people outside, therefore it would not harm you, right? So he's benefiting from what is available on the ground, uh, for what is internal, right? Of what he taught us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to be open to learning from uh, human experience. Uh, Sheikh Ahmed, I'm going to have to uh, lean on you a little bit also about this concept of the masajid being an apartheid state. I'm joking, you didn't say apartheid state. But this, the in-group component, right? Uh, alienation, I know you work a lot with the youth uh, in your community and even beyond your community. Where do you think that comes from? Like the, the luxury that you can sort of be a stickler for exactly how the youth need to be to be accepted in here 
and they need to be that way from day one, right? Salam wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد so i i think part of the um, and i think there's a bit of a of a almost like a theme thread um, part of the issue sometimes is the stereotyping right an idea in the mind of how things should be but perhaps this is not necessarily based in the tradition of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم but it's more perhaps of things that we accumulated through like you know culturally or we habituated by it But one of those things is, is the idea of what the masjid is supposed to be like, right? Um, and, and somehow uh, it shifted from how the, the Prophet's model was from being a center for so many different things. So if you think about the time of the Prophet, uh, the Prophet successfully cultivated and nurtured an unparalleled generation. And it includes also not just the, uh, like, you know, the elderly Sahaba, but More if you look at the, the younger Sahaba, those are the ones that really shouldered the message later on. Yes, the, the greater Sahaba essentially were, were the ones that were from the like, you know, Sishara, from like, the, 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 the uh, Shura board, whatever the case is, but the Prophet ﷺ depended on many of the young individuals to carry out the burden of uh, like, you know, execution, and later on they became the leaders. But where did this happen? It wasn't outside the masjid. It was inside the masjid, right? And the Prophet ﷺ, if you look at his daily routine, like, you know, he would spend so much time in the masjid and people would come in and it was a, a variation between obviously the prayers and the, like, you know, the, the fatwa sessions or the words of wisdom from the Prophet ﷺ or the questions, but also even social things that would happen. Right? That was the center. And so the young individuals had no issue of being in the masjid and sometimes even they would play in the masjid. So moving forward, that somehow changed. Right? And then it turned into an aspect of, like, you know, that the masjid is meant for the five daily prayers. And it has a sacredness that should never be broken by a frequency higher than, I don't know how many decibels, right? If you break that frequency, you're almost shunned right away. And it's, it's really important to, to kind of relax a little bit with that and, and give more leeway um, for the younger individuals to become welcome in the masjid Because going back to that experience, the positive experience, one of the things that turn many of the youth away from the masjid is that negative experience. Right? Sometimes it might even move them away from Islam because if they're not in the masjid, where are they? Right? If we're talking about raising future generation heroes, it does require a masjid that's part of the, like, you know, the, the equation. That masjid is important. Families are busy, right? Then the masjid is left there. It is these events the programs that should be provided for those youth to kind of keep them inside, right? Um, we should understand that, that like, you know, there's something, obviously there's a balance that we have to make sure that's there, obviously. Um, uh, like, you know, and it's not, like, you know, to make, to make sure that the, the, the message is never violated, obviously. But at the same time, it's not a prison system, right? I, I apologize for using that word, right? But it's the first thing that comes to my mind, right? With all the relations, circular relations, like, you know, Um, and yes, of course, we have to take care of the masajid, but we also have to realize in the process of raising that generation, it is okay to sacrifice some of the, like, you know, we have to paint every three years instead of 10, right? Um, it's okay, we don't, like, you know, rather than they broke a chair, it's okay, right? It's just a chair. That chair being broken and replaced. You mean the chandelier? Chandelier, yeah. <laughs> Right. for a soccer ball that being hit or a frisbee, whatever the case is. But trust me, on the long run, our investment in that human resource will come back a hundredfold time. And that individual that broke that chandelier one day will be replacing it by 10 others in 10 different messages. Right. It is that human uh, like, you know, resource that we're investing in. That is our most powerful resource. Like, you know, countries fight over different resources, but the most powerful and most expensive research is the human resource, right? Is those individuals that can either bring up societies or bring it down. That is what we're working on, right? And we have to make sure that our masajid now are, are, are like, you know, have the infrastructure and capabilities and programs to nurture that, right? And there's always this argument, like, you know, our, our heroes born or nurtured. The Prophet ﷺ told us that it's both, right? Some people have inherent characteristics. We build on them, you nurture them, but if they don't have it, it can be acquired. And it's through that environment. Allah. It's like a for that. And I, you said it in passing. I, I wish you would have spent more time on it because 
I think it does simplify the equation. Like everyone knows that the masjid has a expanded role in this day and age and this time and place that we live in because it is serving the function of the entire village. It's the analog of the whole village. And everyone knows that the primary function of the masjid, you know, prioritizing the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal and the salawat and the recitation of the Quran and the atmosphere needs to be there for that sanctity, that solemn atmosphere, of course. But if we were to realize that leaving the masjid doesn't just mean you're not going to be here anymore. Leaving the masjid equals leaving Islam, period. If it's that obvious to the rest of us and the statistics, the numbers are very clear on this. If you don't leave, your kids for sure will be gone. 110%, right? Then it becomes easier for us to say, this is an emergency. So I'm gonna accept it even if it's not like textually true. This is the, the type of darura necessity that would warrant a concession, not just in a scholar's mind, but in any sensible person's mind, right? And that's also what he used to do, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, just to sort of uh, endow this with uh, uh, prophetic sanctioning or revelation as well. He, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wasallam, allowed for you know, the wounded to be taken care of in the masjid because there was no other place to take care of them. Ordinarily, you wouldn't keep a wounded person in the masjid, right or wrong, like he would be bleeding and blood is najis and so on and so forth, right? So that you put them towards the back of the masjid, but they're still in the masjid, right? And so these necessities, these urgent situations, we are, you know, this 1% of the population scattered across a big continent. If we don't accommodate well enough, then they will no longer be Muslim. But Zakallahu khairan for that. Uh, Imam Tom, uh, I want to circle back to uh, Allah protecting us from what we didn't do. You know, I, I often try to gently share with those that I wish the best for them and their masajid, but stagnation has really prolonged that I know you've done everything in your power and it has come at such a huge cost to you personally and wealth-wise and maybe even health-wise. Literally, that is the case for so many of these sincere people. But there's just this little one thing that you could have done that you didn't do, which is believe that there could be someone that could do it better than you, right? Go find the next person. Go find someone to empower and delegate. And so uh, how do we work around this? Yeah, that's a, it's a huge topic, but I'm glad you circled back to it because there's actually a, a line of poetry in English that you would appreciate as an English major. Uh, Every man is guilty of the good he did not do. I am, Bic, you know, I, the, sheikh, the sheikh appreciates it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, we have to realize the forces. Okay, how deep do you want me to get into this? We have to realize what we're up against, okay? There's a lot of uh, fracturing forces that are grinding down upon us as people, a people, collective, as people, individually. Um, you know, being in the West, being in modernity, right? I, I often describe modernity as a fracturing force, okay? It takes things that are whole and it breaks them up into little pieces, right? And so uh, each and every one of us, we're definitely way more individualistic than our grandparents were or their grandparents. Right, they, they're used to thinking collectively. And there's something called like the family corporation. There's books written about it where you see how the immigrant generation, they usually think in terms of like a family corporation. Oldest sibling's gonna do this and the youngest sibling's gonna do that. And everybody, you know, my grandfather was one of 13, right? Uh, coming like from Italy and, and you know, he was a carpenter and this other one was this and this other one was that. And they all sort of pooled resources in a very collective way. Two, three generations down the line, you don't do that, right? And so why is that relevant? Because that's also affecting how we think about masajid, okay? You're not thinking about who's gonna take over the job after me. You're not thinking about what's the 10 year plan, what's the 20 year plan, what's the 50 year plan. You're just thinking, okay, it's like, well, we just had an election and now I'm the board president and okay, we're gonna have community dinners every month, right? Alhamdulillah, everyone loves the community dinners, but that's very low level planning. You know what I mean? It's like, we have to be thinking about Okay, who's gonna take this up after I'm gone? What is it gonna be like in five years that's going to be better, right? Can I delegate or even break up some of, the, just like you know, the, the ulum, right? If you look into the ulum sharia, right? The different sort of disciplines, the Islamic disciplines that have come about, you start with something like usul al-fiqh, and then after time, you get something, you know, farra, min, right? You get something that sort of branches off. Maqasid al-sharia is a branch off of that, right? And so similarly, 
Like if you're doing something in the masjid, you have a leadership position, you run a program, you need to think about succession, okay? How can we make this sustainable? Who's gonna take it over after me? The people who are gonna take it over after me, is there a way that I can involve more people? Can we scale it? Can we shift it? Can we uh, share it with the, the masjid next door? Masjid down the street, the masjid on the other side of town, right? All these sorts of issues like have to be at the forefront, but it takes like a very, I believe it takes a very conscious decision to think collectively. To think collectively as an ummah, as a community, like for us, like Allentown folks, like, okay, this is what we're gonna try to do. Or if you're, you know, North Jersey folks or wherever you are, that you have to, we have to think more than just beyond the four walls of a masjid, more than just beyond our generation, more than just your two year, three year, four year term as the president or whatever is your tenure as an imam. That's the sort of level of thinking that it's gonna take to get beyond where we're at. Is that low khairan for the warakallahu fiqh? Uh, Dr. Zara, I know you've done uh, a lot of work on this and I have been sort of uh, listening to it online and elsewhere, which is, you know, this requires its own level of heroics, uh, to be honest, to, to weed out, you know, what must stay from our sort of working model in our heads, in our understanding of Islam and what is adaptable, right? What can even be imported from, dare we say, the West, right? Dare we say, uh, sort of the progress on the ground uh, and, and the strength, the infrastructure, the management, even the ideas, even the movements uh, of Western civilization, uh, even if it may be cresting right now, it is very much at its peak relatively to stronger than so many other civilizations in certain respects. Uh, how do we prevent that sort of unnecessary dismissal that we spoke about earlier, the gatekeeping even, in terms of what we can uh, recruit of sciences, of, of ideas? It's a great question. Um, people have proposed different ways that, uh, you know, scholars and people of knowledge in different areas of life and thought can work together. And obviously, the different types of knowledge exist in a hierarchy. Uh, as one scholar put it, you know, knowledge of the angels is not the same as knowledge of the, the mollusks, right? The, the tiny little microbes under the sea. And so uh, we understand that because each type of knowledge, each area of knowledge has a different object, you know, uh, we study the attributes of Allah, that's the, high, you know, the highest form, and then we study, uh, for example, physical biology, that's a lower form, it's made up of a different substance, but there has to be perhaps a better path forward where scholars and specialists in different areas of life work together to try to take those universal principles of Islam and let them be a filter, like uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson said that the scripture is a sieve, which uh, in a case like me you didn't know, is something you use when you're baking. So you put the different ingredients in it and you sift out uh, the, the pure material and whatever is impure and doesn't belong in your recipe gets caught in, in, inside the sieve. So uh, Dr. Jackson said that scripture is a sieve and we put all human institutions through it. And whatever is beneficial comes through and whatever's harmful gets caught behind. So none of this implies that if something is Western, it is harmful, and if it's from the East or the Middle East, it's beneficial per se. Uh, so maybe, you know, to continue to work on this, how can people who have expertise in different areas of life, you know, the teachers and the farmers and um, the people who study society and the people who know how wealth moves in society, how can they work together with scholars of sacred sciences to? Uh, to implement that filter and that sieve and to really refresh our institutions here in America as American Muslims and our community is made up of so many different communities, right? We're not a single community. Every community has its own specific uh, cultural heritage and cultural baggage, right? So uh, using, how can we renew the universal principles to try to separate that which is neutral and which is not harmful and belongs to culture and has the weight of law and should be celebrated no matter where you're from uh, and that which is harmful no matter which culture it's coming from and should be avoided um, to try to create something that is more beneficial for the whole community. So can we get, uh, you know, a bit of, uh, not necessarily itemization, I see the clock running on us, but what, Management, for example, I hear Dr. Imam Tom speaking on management being a science. I mean to respect that science, and that's so important. You know, I had a message. I'll share with you a quick story uh, to my point. 
thinking about like sustainability. It's one of the strengths of the, of the West. The infrastructure is so matured here. Uh, if you would like to speak to that, but a message, you know, uh, from New York City <laughs> after I moved to Allentown asked me to come back and take over. So I told them, no, I'm not coming back and I'm not taking over. And they're like, no, we really need you here. I was like, the problem is you think you need me here. I can guarantee you there are people that attend your Jumu'ah for the past 5, 10, 15 years that you're refusing to believe can take this place in much better directions, much faster than me. These people could be sort of like C-level, like corporate level, uh, you know, executive level officials, uh, managers, uh, leaders in Fortune 500 companies, right? In sort of like global organizations. And so we have these here and for, there are multiple reasons. I don't want to oversimplify it. Even in my head, I can recognize multiple reasons why it doesn't happen, but we are holding out on ourselves by refusing to recognize the talent that's under our nose and that our Dean called us to. So like the, the endowments and what they do for universities, how can we bring that to the Masajid? You know, maybe as one example, I know you wrote on this for Yaqeen as well. If you can share a snippet of it, that would be really useful for many people. I had someone stop me in the hallway on the way over here and told me, how do we centralize our awqaf? I was like, oh, it's kind of early, but <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're thinking. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, the, the awqaf, the charitable endowments were one of the main pillars of Islamic civilization for all of its history from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the first endowment, uh, which was a, a grove of, palm, of uh, date palms, which was donated to the Medinan poor, all the way through, um, you know, basically the beginning to the mid of the Ottoman Empire. So for a good thousand years, uh, the charitable endowment was one of the hallmarks of Islamic civilization. And it, it was a culture uh, that valued giving, and not just giving uh, to feed a person for a day, but giving to create an institution, a trust as an institution, which would be sustainable and self-growing and would uh, allow people to come and take advantage. The beneficiaries, uh, you know, they didn't have to meet any stringent requirements. It was just delegated to certain segments of the population who would benefit from a particular waqf, whether that waqf was a farming tool or it was uh, glass blowing classes, or it was a soup kitchen or a public bath, or you know, as times changed, the akaf also changed. So the, the culture really was not so much in, for example, if there's uh, a large donors, right, to, um, to an Islamic school or to a, to a masjid, that necessarily those are the same as the board members who have executive decision. The culture was more like when we endow a trust and people come and they benefit from that trust uh, in perpetuity, right, forever, uh, until, you know, if Allah wills, somehow it, it comes undone. But the idea was this will be uh, forever, that those blessings continue to accumulate for the person who endowed and for their family and for, you know, everyone comes and makes those duas, uh, you know, from touching the Kaaba or from uh, benefiting from that waqf. And so the difference between power and giving, you know, it was separated. And perhaps uh, some of the modern culture in the United States where we have to accumulate a lot and we have to be driven by the imperatives of wealth, some of that perhaps has you know, taken away from that previous culture where uh, the giving for the sake of giving and for the sake of accruing blessings was different from, from decision making and power and not sharing that power. So that, that can be uh, something to renew in this time. Jazakallah khairan for that. So everybody go to your masjid and harass them about building a waqf, inshallah, but make sure you're the first donors, right? Some of the major, biggest hospitals and hospital networks, even though some of these hospitals are actually for profit, so many of these universities are able to hire who they hire and sort of fund the research that they fund and recruit, you know, with full rides, full scholarships, you know, the, the top echelon of talent around the world. It's because they have billions and billions of dollars accrued into a waqf system that was actually you know, a thousand years prior, uh, the mainstay or the hallmark, iconic of Islamic civilization. So this is maybe even a bad example. I'm going to correct myself here and say something that our dean said to us, don't hesitate to take what is beneficial from outside. This is actually taking from outside what was brought out from within us, right? Relearning, remembering what was once uh, the driving force on the ground after Allah Azza wa Jal behind so many efforts and good causes. Uh, and efforts, initiatives towards the well-being of humanity and the spread of Allah Azza wa Jal's great deen. But bringing it back to the masajid, uh, Sheikh Ahmed, 
staffing, right? Uh, you have one of two questions. Whatever which one, whichever of them you don't answer, I'm going to throw on Imam Tom to close us out. All right? So uh, the skill set of the staffing or the importance of staffing over volunteers. Give us a picture. You're someone that works on the, in, uh, on the ground itself. You're not sort of an ivory tower thinker. You, you see, right? When you actually hit the ground, you, you realize the, the real problems with many of these youth. So the importance of staffing and just giving up on the volunteer uh, leaders or mentors uh, model uh, while appreciating, of course, what they do or the skill sets so that we don't sort of give the bread to other than its baker. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So the, um, if you're talking about like, you know, just how they, you know, the, the essentially the, the staffing or whomever is dealing with the, with the youth, I guess, essentially, or, or, or like, you know, it, generally speaking, even with anybody coming to the masjid, right? It's not necessarily just the, the young individuals. Um, it's important to realize that um, considering the, the environment that we live in, uh, like on you know, how quick people can research things and the amount of information that's out there and people acquire it, you, you're going to realize that, that the, the, the people that come in already come in with a wealth of information, not necessarily the correct information, right? A wealth of information, a bunch of misconceptions together and, and all these like, you know, questions that they have um, and, and so it's important for the person who is interacting directly with them, uh, whether once again it's the general population or the youth individuals, to be kind of very well trained, um, Islamically obviously, right? Actually that's the first thing, like you know, uh, I'm gonna combine two things, especially if we're gonna talk about like, you know, the younger individuals. So obviously the, the, those individuals who will say our staffs, we'll start with the staffs, essentially if they're hired, they have to be very well rooted um, in our Islamic tradition in our teachings, and I mean very well because you're gonna be dealing with a whole lot of questions, uh, whether it is a, a fatwa style question or a contemporary issue that they're facing or even a misconception you're gonna to have to dispel uh, to the point sometimes it's a misconception that is putting them, putting them on the border of like, you know, their faith, uh, something that's really is, like, you know, affecting their, their belief. Um, so how are you gonna address that to pull them back in right, in a religion, but also to answer them in a way that will intellectually suffice them, like intellectually make them feel content. They, they're having an appetite. Um, and at the same time, being able to, uh, like, you know, address all the multiple uh, aspects that they're, they're thinking of because of the environment they're in. That requires that kind of level, but also at the same time, really sometimes requires a level of individual that has a really good solid background, for example, in uh, mental well health, well-being. Like, you know, the whole aspect of, of social, emotional, uh, psychological, spiritual well-being. I, I find that, like, you know, at least in, in the position that I'm in, that's a tool that I, I, like, you know, I had to go through quite a sense of training because it's almost like sometimes some of these two, like, you know, the question that they're asking or misconception is somehow sometimes tied in together with that, right? And so you're going to be able to address both. You have to understand what's the background of why they're asking this question. Is it a negative experience that they had, right? Or is it whatever it is exactly it is, but that's really important. So if we're gonna have a system where we don't have that, instead of have volunteers, you can imagine how quickly that can kind of just collapse, right? Or lead to negative consequences. And I'm not opposed to volunteers being there, but like, you know, I'm, like, you know, volunteers have to be there. We have to give them the necessary training Right? If they don't have it, if they're volunteers and have the, like, you know, the, the wealth of experience uh, that is there, then this is, like, we should capitalize on that. Right? We should bring those in to help improve our situation, our masajid. We can never ever, like, you know, uh, like we always need volunteers. Um, but we have to make sure that one, they have the, the right background, they're in the right position with the right skill sets. If not, if we need them, then why not train them? Right? Mentor them. Uh, like, you know, connect them with individuals or provide them with the necessary um, information they need before they start in that role, right? Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Jazakallah khairan for that. Is it still on? Yeah, Jazakallah khairan khair for that. So, of course, we can, we can never, we will never ever uh, fully wean off of the volunteers, but that notion of, like, the volunteers are all we can ever have and whatever they give us is good enough, is better than nothing, and... Uh, mindset is going to hold us back. You know, just yesterday in my masjid, and Imam Tom, I'll hand off with this to you. Uh, I was blown away because it's not even uh, typical of my masjid at all. 
but I was thinking all day yesterday because I sat there at about 12 o'clock, you know, this, this sweet elderly lady walks in and like she, she didn't know like, is she in the right place? Is she even allowed to be in here? And she called me out. Some of you may have seen this sort of online. Uh, and as soon as I walked sort of towards the, the door of the office I was in, I noticed immediately she was wearing a, uh, a necklace with a, a silver shaping of uh, the historical Palestine borders. And she's like, you know, I saw the billboards on the highways, stand for Palestine and save Gaza and call your Congress people and so on and so forth. I was wondering, can I donate to this? And very sweet lady. Uh, and so she gave us a very humble donation and she's just like, I noticed that the logo on your mosque, Jesus Son of Mary Mosque was the logo on the board. So I just had to pull over and it was spontaneous is what I'm trying to say, right? And then two hours later, I was rushing actually out to an appointment and Reverend Burns, who works at DeSales University, uh, he stopped and he said, you know, ever since I saw the video of uh, children having surgery performed on them uh, without anesthetic while wide awake, my heart has been broken. Uh, and we have this very wealthy donor <laughs> in our community who donated sort of these medical supplies, surgical supplies uh, to the university. And he was uh, authorized to forward them if he, at his discretion. So he was wondering if I can figure out a way to get them into Gaza for him. So, uh, you know, initially, of course, there's a bit of suspicion, like who you're working for and who sent you and stuff. Uh, but after all things checked out, I was walking out of the building saying, what in the world is happening? You know, twice in two hours. But at the same time, what if the door was closed? What if there was no imam? Right. What if there wasn't staff and any masjid across the country, to be honest, uh, that is operating programs and services above average, not to say that the average is great. Uh, it directly correlates with how much dedicated staff they have. It's just, it's a mathematical equation. Imam Tom, I know you, you're always pushing uh, for people to professionalize, uh, not just the amount of staff, but the quality of staff and how the staff are uh, empowered, not just compensated. So can you do share with us some wisdom on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it just comes back to having uh, high aspirations, which is something that we talk about in the Dean all the time. Like, what's your vision for what's the uppermost of the mesh it could be? Right, uh, owning 300 acres and employing 100 people, and you know having an enormous multi-billion-dollar wealth and running soup kitchens, and like we should think big, you know what I mean? And if we get halfway there, alhamdulillah, you know what I mean? So I mean, you can't even take a step in that direction if you don't start to professionalize the masjid and the personnel that are at the masjid, right? Uh, you, to have even the cleaning staff not professionalized is a liability. Somebody comes, comes there and it's not a pleasant place to be. Like that's user experience. That's something that's gonna make someone never come back or you know, turn somebody away. Let alone like uh, an imam or a leader that's not qualified that's going to give you some sort of brusque answer. Let alone people who are teaching your children in the weekend schools and things like that, right? It's like we should look at every single thing. This is ihsan at the end of the day, right? If we can make the masjid the best that it can possibly be, what would it look like? And then reverse engineer it and try to get as close as possible as we can. And the thing that, that, that kills me, or let's put a positive spin on it, the thing that makes me optimistic why we can do it is because we do this in other things in our lives, right? We do this with uh, if somebody is gonna start a company or, or a nonprofit, right? It's just like we haven't done it with the masjid enough. And maybe this is what Sheikh Ahmed you know, was identifying when he was talking about this sort of idealized, you know, us all just sitting every piece of billah, nobody getting paid, nothing like, you know, into the hand, out of the hand, you know, just like, yeah, it sounds really romantic, right? But yeah, at the end of the day, uh, like, well, I'm going to tie a bunch of threads together. If we're saying that there are certain management techniques, there are certain uh, institution building techniques, there are certain, you know, yeah, land banks and wakfs and, you know, capacity building techniques, that other people have discovered, or even better, were originally ours <laughs> that need to be resuscitated and revived, then bismillah, then the path just has to be walked and it's right there in front of us, low hanging fruit. Let's do it. We actually have time for one more question. So Dr. Zahra, are you gonna close us out, inshallah? Uh, I remember uh, as a child, I, I, as a young man, I, I went to a, uh, a lecture at CSI, College of Staten Island uh, for Imam Siraj Wahaj. And he said, you guys ever been to the airport 
and you sit you see those huge yellow triangles that say we're sorry for our appearance you know under renovations he said we need a lot of those for the ummah we're really sorry for our appearance the ummah is under construction <laughs> we'll be right back please hold good things coming under new management uh and i i i often uh it is so called behind the mimbar but and I know you're, you're going to struggle a little bit with this because you're, you're too respectful of scholarship. Not too respectful. You're very respectful, mashallah, of scholarship. But many a times growing up, I felt this, that like even the, uh, the khutbah itself was not intellectually stimulating. The narrative, and forget the khutbah because I know the imam for you is going to be uh, sort of off limits. May Allah bless you and increase you. But just the discourse in masajid, right? Not intellectually satisfying for people that have sort of Western educations a lot of times, that at least at first glance does come off as far more valuable, far more airtight, far more sophisticated uh, and grounded. So what advice would you give anyone who feels disenfranchised from masjid spaces uh, because of sort of the, at times, intellectual shabbiness of the discourse? I feel like I've been set up. <laughs> I'm but, so sorry. Uh, Bismillah. Uh, well, first of all, I think that, um, you know, the first condition that has to be met before a person can have knowledge is adab. So for me, if a, if a khutbah is speaking to the spiritual needs of, of the people who are listening, then it has done its job. I don't necessarily go to a khutbah expecting for, you know, uh, academic discourse, right? There's other spaces for that. And um, in order to kind of uh, succeed in the other spaces of life, whatever spaces you come from, or academic spaces, you would first need to have uh, a grounding and a foundation and a spiritual nourishment. And when the khatib speaks to the Quran and the Sunnah and reminds us of all of the tenets of our faith, then that would help us, right, uh, in our other endeavors. Um, at the same time, I guess I would say that we want our spaces, you know, uh, our Muslim spaces, our community spaces, to be safe spaces for the practice of faith and for the life and the thought of faith. But we don't necessarily want them to be like a, a bubble in the sense that they are impenetrable to what is, it, what is happening outside of the walls of those spaces. And perhaps that can be a little bit of the disconnect uh, or discouragement that some people attending such a khutbah might experience. And in my own experience, a lot has changed in the last 30 years. Uh, in terms of what a khutbah sounds like, right? Now, obviously, not every masjid is the same, but there's been an, an uh, in terms of like masajid that are from immigrant communities, like Arab and South Asian communities, which are most of the masajid I've ever been to in my life. I know the African American masajid are totally different. Their experience is different and their khutbahs are different. But, uh, you know, there seems to have been an indigenization, right? The generational gaps are moving forward and the next generation of, um, uh, imams are giving khutbahs that are different from what was perhaps going on 20 and 30 years ago. So um, your question again, what would be my advice with respect to what? Yeah, because I, I personally felt disillusioned from Masajid. I personally would sort of like uh, not be looking forward to the khutbah. I would feel like it just doesn't apply to me. It is sort of a bubble. It, I, a lot of times people struggle with their faith because they have a very basic question in their mind, even if it's not spelled out clearly in their, you know, in their consciousness, which is, what am I supposed to look like, right, as a Muslim today? Yes? And so, like, one brother came up to me and said, you know why I love Mufti Meng so much? Because he, he's Muslim and he's cool, right? He's like a scholar that somehow gets on a jet ski. That's what he said to me. And I never thought of this before, right? So we have to work against not just the stereotyping, but also the realities that we sometimes perpetuate. Like, we self-alienate ourselves from our communities. Uh, also, by speaking sometimes even... Uh, in niches that we have not mastered. So we can't also uh, sort of project the blame on society and sort of the secular demonization of masajid or imams or, or Muslims or clerics or otherwise. What would be your advice to people that actually see this? And many of us recognize that it is there. What would you say? And I guess you sort of your comment about adab is very important and prioritizing. I mean, the, the master of the mollusks, as you put it, no matter how fancy, is always gonna be superior to the master. Uh, of the sciences regarding Allah Azza wa and his angels. So if you'd like to add anything there, we can close out with it, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, maybe perhaps just uh, to feel uh, 
uh, empowered to communicate with, with, the, with the Masjid leadership and with uh, the people in the Masjid, respectfully, of course, but, uh, you know, what, what nowadays we love to call taking ownership, right? Not, not like a coup d'etat of the Masjid or anything like that, but taking ownership of being a member of the community, right? And so uh, valuing that your input, when shared respectfully, uh, can benefit everybody in the community. So if, if there is a pressing issue that, you know, is not being addressed from the member, then perhaps uh, being the person who brings it to light and asks that it be addressed and be provided, you know, within the context of spiritual guidance to address a practical need in the community can be beneficial not only to the question burning in your own mind, but maybe to others who are uh, also asking a similar question. So just don't be afraid to uh, step up and communicate. Jazakallah khairan for that. Absolutely. I just want to reiterate, like, be that person that speaks on behalf of everyone else who might be thinking the same thing. That's the right of your Muslim community on you, and that's the right of your imams on you as well, and the leadership on you as well. Uh, I'll close out with the statement of Umar radiallahu anhu, who used to say, despite being the head of state and the khatib, la khayra fikum in lam taquluha, wa la khayra fina in lam nasma'ah. There's a mutual sort of responsibility here. He said, there is no good in you if you don't say it, you don't extend this advice, and no good in us if we don't listen. So may Allah bring the best out of all of us and allow us to uh, pour it into our masajid to bring the best out of them. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khayyan everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.